So welcome again, my name is Anna Draniewicz and we will today uh, talk about how humor was used in uh, communist times uh, to fight with the system. Um, this is a part of my um, research project that I am doing for the Victims of Communist Memorial Foundation in Washington, D.C. And um, I would like you all to take part in the survey at the end of this uh, event. Not today, but at the, at the end, which will be happening next Saturday. So um, the week after, we will send you an email with a few questions. We want, we want you to do it only once. So if you watch more than one film, uh, you might get emails uh, for each of them. But in the server, there will be a choice for you to, to highlight which films you've seen with us. So just do it once say which films you watched, uh, and then answer just five uh, short questions. So, uh, as I mentioned, that, will, that is a part uh, of my project. So if you uh, have any questions um, outside today's um, event, after it's finished, for example, or even during, uh, you can email me, and you can just send them uh, to my email address. My fellowship finishes in the end of July, so um, after that, this email won't be working. So I'm gonna put it in chat right now and hopefully you'll be able to see it. You can copy it because after we close this um, window, you won't be able to um, access it anymore. But you can always just find my email on the website of the Victims of Communist Memorial Foundation or by uh, Googling. So this is one thing uh, I would like you to uh, send questions that they will come to your head after this is finished. But during the, this event, you can go to the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you cannot see it in Zoom right now, you just need to move the, the mouse and it should appear. So you just click on the Q&A and you can type your question anytime. I would also like you to use it during the film. You will be watching the film in a separate link. You, we will give you some time, uh, so you will be able to... Um, the chat is disabled, I cannot see your email. I'm sorry, I just read uh, um, an information in the Q&A box. Could we please uh, make sure that we can, uh, people can access the chat right now, please? Let's try that. Okay, so um, during the film, and we will give you some time to watch it. The film is only one hour and five minutes, but we will give you more time because um, I know some people are not used to um, reading subtitles. So you will have a, a possibility to go back if you didn't catch something or if something surprised you, there is a scene that you don't understand. That's when you can stop, go back to Zoom and uh, send me the question. You'll be also able to ask those questions uh, when the Q&A starts, but if during the film there's anything that comes to your mind, then just, just put it there and I will be looking at them during the film and then after the film is finished, we will go back here, come back to the Zoom uh, window, so don't close it. Uh, we will not be able to hear you, so you will not be bothering any other people. I will mute myself and we will all watch the film together. And then exactly sharp at 6 p.m. Eastern time, so 7 uh, Central and 5 Pacific, uh, we will start our uh, Q&A. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, we have license for um, USA to show this film only. So I'm afraid only people who are in the United States right now will be able to see the film. If you are outside the USA uh, and you are a Polish speaker, you can easily find it anywhere else. If you want to refresh your memory, you can find it on YouTube. Also, if you have, if, if you're anywhere in the world and you have Netflix, uh, this film is available right now uh, on that platform. Um, so, as I said, the, the way we we're going to do it uh, from the organizational side is that first we will have a short introduction and some talk um about uh, the subject then we will give you a link um where the film is uh, waiting for you on vimeo 
and then we will give you the password. And after you finish watching, you can maybe have a quick break. Uh, and when 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, starts, come back here, we'll have one hour of the Q&A. Another thing I have to mention uh, right now is the, the fact that we were supposed to have the director of the film, the cruise, with us today. Unfortunately, um, I have a bad news. The director is, will not be able to join us. We only found out a few, day, a few hours ago today. He really wanted to be here. Unfortunately, he had an accident and few operations. He still hoped by today he will be able to be with, here with us online, but uh, unfortunately it was not possible. But because we've been actually organizing this uh, event since October last year, we've been in touch with him for a, quite a long time, even before the accident. Uh, he was supposed to come here um, and take part in uh, this uh, retrospective in person in Washington, D.C. That was obviously before the pandemic. Uh, then when we said that we have to move the event uh, online, he was still very happy to do it with us. Uh, he said he will connect with us and, um, and answer the questions. But uh, because all of that, he actually started to prepare himself already. So in the end, he, he was able to send us an introduction. Um, and uh, we have an interpreter with us here today, um, because as I said, we only find out a few hours ago that the director himself will not be here. So uh, right before the film, she will read you uh, the letter that he has sent, um, and she will uh, pass the message. She will translate it to you live, <laughs> as, if she, as if he was here. Um, so that's about the director, and that change actually makes a big difference as well. Um, as I mentioned before, this film is only one hour and five minutes, and we were planning uh, to have a, a quick chat with the director beforehand about the film, how it was made, uh, before you even start asking questions. So we actually had more time prepared for that hoping that you know, he will be saying a lot of interesting things. So we um, planned uh, to start at one, and uh, also we wanted to keep like same starting time for both Saturdays. So it was all very well planned. Unfortunately, now, because of the little changes that we have, um, well, we will have to... <laughs> uh, you will have to listen to me for that time that you were supposed to listen to him. But not only, I have a good news, don't worry. Uh, he also asked us to um, show you a short film he made while he was still in the Łódź Film School in Poland. It's a very funny film that will give you an idea uh, what to expect from the cruise. Because um, Marek Piwowski was a, a very specific director for his time. First of all, he was already born in the communist country. Uh, so that was the only reality he knew. But he was one of those directors who decided um, to look for ways of, of showing the reality. Uh, because as uh, some other directors in Poland were saying, for example, Krzysztof Kieślowski, the propaganda was so strong uh, that you couldn't really see what is really happening. All the images that you were able to access, either uh, first in cinemas, later on TV and radio, to the radio, they were all uh, propaganda uh, messages. So, as, as Kieślowski said, the reality was undescribed, was not described, and that's what people, uh, filmmakers in in 70s, end of 60s, beginning of 70s, started to do. Try to show the, the world around them, to describe it. Because as Kieślowski said, uh, living in and this, the world is not described is very hard because you cannot relate to anything. There are no words to talk about some things. And that's connected with another thing that I want to talk about, which is uh, something that George Orwell mentioned in his book, 1984. He called this thing, which we called in Polish Novomowa, uh, it was translated from the English word newspeak. 
That was the official language of the communist regime. It was different. Uh, so in case of Poland, it was different from the Polish language that people were used to. Uh, it meant that people had to talk in a very mm, not natural way. And uh, this film, The Cruise, will be, um, will have some of the jokes that are actually based on the fact that people are using this new speak language. Now, obviously this, you will watch it uh, in, translated into English. Um, so some of the things might be lost in the translation, but there will be also a situational humor. So there should be no problem with uh, this kind of uh, scenes. This film is black and white. It's the only black and white film that we are going to show during this retrospective. And the rest of them is colored. And this film is also different from any other film actually ever made in Poland before or after. What uh, Marek Piwowski did was just showing people as they are. Most of the actors, or actually amateurs, uh, so most of the people that you will see on the screen are not professional actors. Only the few main characters are played by, by professional actors. Everybody else was engaged uh, or hired for the film because of the way they look. So expect a lot of very um, the faces that say a lot. Um, <laughs> the, the way that the um, casting for this film was uh, done uh, was by um, putting an advertisement in a newspaper saying, if you can sing, dance, or do whatever, come to the casting. And it was actually, there, there were many castings all around Poland. So you could compare it to, um, I don't know, uh, the star or uh, America Got Talent or, or this kind of programs that we actually can watch now. But please remember that was 50 years ago in a communist country. Obviously, the director had a lot of problems with this film because back then, every film was made in uh, something we would translate literally as film team or uh, a film studio. And uh, because Lenin said that cinema is one of the most important of all the arts, the government was putting a lot of pressure uh, on the filmmakers. At first, at the beginning, uh, right after the war, then in the 50s and 60s, they had to make their films in the socialist uh, style. Uh, and uh, Piwowski obviously broke that rule completely, but he still had to first submit this uh, script to the censors uh, and the committee that would decide if this film should be made or not. Then after the film was finished, there was still a meeting during which uh, some people watched it and uh, were deciding if it should be shown or not. And then the censors also had their um, say <laughs> and they actually asked the director to cut off uh, some scenes. That's why this film now is only one hour and five minutes. It was a regular hour and a half film, but uh, the, unfortunately the, the scenes that were cut off uh, were lost and uh, we are not able to reconstruct it in its full uh, glory. So all we have is the reconstruction of the, of the film that was shown in 1970. It was filmed a year earlier in 1969 uh, and then in 1970, the director has a lot, had a lot of problems uh, because um, people uh, the gov in the government were not very happy with that film and um, decided in the end to allow him to show it in cinemas, but only in two copies. That was quite popular uh, thing to do by the government. That was another way of censorship. So uh, another way of uh, making sure people don't watch the films that theoretically has been released uh, was to not inform people what films will be shown or change in last minute. So uh, this film was really seen by most of Polish people 10 years later. Uh, in the uh, beginning of 80s when Solidarity started to rule and before the so-called Solidarity Carnival was finished by the martial law in 90, December 1981, uh, there was this moment of freedom in Poland. And this film then got more copies uh, and was released, re-released uh, again in Poland. And since then, up to our times today, and let me remind you, it's been 50 years, 
it actually gained a status of a cult film. It was the first and the, it's the biggest uh, cult film in Poland. Also the most famous uh, in a way, people voted for the best Polish films, choose it as number one. Um, but we have to remember that's the case right now. Uh, cult films are the kind of films that speak to a generation and they get the cult base, which means that people who watch it over and over again know them, the um, quotes by heart. And it usually is a, a, a generation of, of a cult base that might change. So what I'm trying to say that even though this uh, film got this, this status of cult film um, over the last 50 years, in the next 50 years, it might be a different situation and it might not be a cult film, people might not watch it anymore. But right now they rewatch it over and over again and the new generations also uh, watch it, uh, love it, and uh, repeat those, those uh, sentences uh, from, from the film. Uh, and also another thing of the cult films uh, is that people uh, will recognize when they hear uh, this one sentence or the other, they know which film it is from. And trust me, uh, there, all of the films that we are going to show are this kind of films and there are groups on Facebook, for example, or forums where people use only quotes from the, the films that they love. And uh, it's, it's really amazing because you, you, nobody says anything from themselves. They just quote uh, one film after another. So the film this way is still alive. And uh, this one is one in its, on its own, really. It was uh, improvised, mostly. There was a script. But in the script it says, and then we will show the real, the life around us, which was not really, um, the, the censors were not happy about that part, but because it was in the script and the script uh, was uh, given the green light, there was nothing uh, they could do about it. So this is the film that we're gonna watch today, but before that happens, uh, I would like to do what Mr. Pivovsky asked me uh, to do, which is showing his um, uh, other short film. It's only nine minutes long, a little bit above nine minutes, from 1966. And this film is called Welcome Kirk. It's about the visit of Kirk Douglas in the Polish film school in the 60s. Uh, and um, there will be no subtitles there because people speak half English, half Polish. So you should have no problems uh, understanding um, what's happening. Uh, and it will give you an idea of uh, director's style uh, and where he was looking for communism uh, in, in real situations, real uh, people's faces and uh, in a real life. So let's start uh, with that. Uh, we're gonna show you the film right now and then I will speak a little bit for, about the, um, the role of humor in, in, in communist times, but very shortly, I promise, and then we will watch um, the cruise. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so uh, obviously Kirk Douglas has no, had no idea what's going to happen when he was visiting the school. Uh, this was all organized by the students and it was all improvised. So uh, this is exactly what you're going to see in the film, The Cruise, that we are going to uh, watch very shortly. Um, before that happens, though, let me just have a short introduction from my side about the project that I'm working on uh, here, uh, about the, the um, communism and um, humor. I will just read very short um, uh, introduction. Um, as George Orwell said, uh, every joke is a tiny revolution. However, various uh, academics from the field of humor studies still disagree if humor can be a tool of fight with, uh, against regime, a form of peaceful uh, protest, or merely a safety valve. According to relief theory of humor, it can play a therapeutic and cathartic role, and Sigmund Freud believed that it allows people to express forbidden thoughts, and therefore is a coping mechanism. In Soviet bloc, uh, that was obviously the case, and the laughter was giving people the feeling of freedom, helped integrate and helped with the bond forming. And that all allowed people to come together and stand against uh, the regime. So we can talk more about um, the impact of humor on the system uh, later, after the film, during the Q&A. I will have a look at all your comments and, and questions uh, soon when we will be watching it. Um, so to be able to watch the film, uh, I have to send you the link. So let me remind you again, you have to open a Vimeo program uh, in a moment, click on that link, it's in the uh, chat, and then you will use the following password that I'm going to send in chat in a second. And please remember to come back here in exactly one hour and 25 minutes. Let me remind you that uh, the film is one hour and five minutes. So you will have a little bit more time. You can stop the film. You can go back a little. You can stop to be able to read the subtitles, for example, uh, and also to send questions during the film. 
if you have a question, please uh, send it using our Q&A button at the bottom of the, of the screen. Before we go and watch it, uh, let me just remind you that we did receive the letter from the director who is in the hospital right now, but he prepared it in advance. He was getting ready for this event uh, and he wrote um, a letter that um, our translator, Ms. Anna Skupień, uh, will read to you right now. So can we please um, get our interpreter? Just a second, you are mute. So we will have to unmute you. The cross is a comedy about how the authority, for example, a country, government, some kind of committee and so on, uses the culture to gain its political goals. And the lower the rank of, the, of that authority, the better for the comedy. In the cruise, the authority is the committee of the cruise on the cruise ship. Why is the, cru why is the cruise a comedy? Because comedy is the best tool to show what the communist authorities were up to. If I made a film about how this authority is dangerous and scary, then paradoxically it would suit that authority. This authority wanted to look scary because it was not chosen by the nation, but imposed by the Soviet Union. It didn't have the democratic legitimacy to govern. It didn't have the support of the nation and that's why it was weak. That's why it wanted to pass for strong, dangerous and scary. But it itself was afraid of only one thing, the laughter because funny is not scary. That's why the cruise is the comedy. That fear against the laughter we can see here in one scene in which the poet refuses to take part in making a human pyramid in honor of the authority. In this case, the captain of the ship. As a punishment, he is forced to play a game of Salonovitz, men about town in loose translation. This is a thematic game in which normally one person turns around and then somebody slaps his backside and he has to guess who slapped him. The other name of this game is Dupovnik, as person. So in this film, there is only one person playing with him, so it's easy to guess who did it. There is no alternative. This whole scene was removed by the censor, censors because of the accusation that it is an allusion to the communist elections where the authority would present only one candidate and the whole election was, would just mean that people throw the ballot card with that one name on the, onto the ballot boxes. The out optimistic outcome was that after six months of my interventions and meeting on the higher level, I have received the following telegram. I allow the scene of the as person from Minister of Culture and Art. So because the minister allows it, let's start the projection before he changes his mind. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, let's do it. Please come back in one hour and 20 minutes for the Q&A. Thank you very much. As Marek Piwowski in his letter that we read before the film said, the authority wants you to be scared. They don't want you to laugh at them because that makes them smaller and less scary. But what was happening with the system, with every decade, it was getting weaker and weaker, and we can see that. So in the 60s, it was still um, not very possible because the government was controlling all filmmaking. It was only the end of the 60s, beginning of 70s, when the situation in the country changed, when a film like this was uh, possible to, to be made. Obviously, the censorship was still not happy with it, but somehow we managed to, to have that film done and, and now we are able to see it. 
And that will lead me to the first question um, in which um, Dan is asking, have there ever been attempts to find the lost footage? Has the director provided any insight into what specifically was censored? So yes, of course, uh, there were actually, there is an urban legend saying that uh, the missing parts of this film, uh, from time to time, somebody says that they found it. But unfortunately, that is not uh, the truth. So we still can have hope because it did happen with other films. Um, Teddy Bear that we will be showing in a few days, that was actually the case um, that the person who was making the copies uh, and cutting off the scenes uh, kept it. But most of the time when the censors told to cut off a scene, it was just destroyed. So unfortunately, no, <laughs> this is it. We don't know exactly what was cut off because the scenes that the director mentioned were supposed to be cut off um, are the ones that they state, like the um, Salonowiec scene. And here I have used my, I will use my cheat sheet. Salonowiec means man about town, as was said in the letter. It is also known as Dupovnik, and so be, excuse me, my French as person, because the whole idea is that somebody is uh, turning around and then uh, people around him slap him at the backside, and he has to guess who did it. In this film, this scene was supposed to be cut off. In the end, um, good for us, because it's a quite important scene in a way. This whole film is about the authority, about how, uh, how it changes people. And that scene was to sh used to show that the um, philosopher who didn't want to take part in physical um, exercises uh, was punished this way. It was used to punish. So it was a, a funny scene, but it had really much uh, sa sudden <laughs> and deeper uh, meaning. And obviously a lot of this, uh, the scenes in this film were a little bit sometimes surreal or abstract. And the ending as well, uh, some people might ask, what is this all about? But this boat symbolized Poland and it's also like a arc of Noah uh, uh, with different kinds of people. In the end, they even dress for the, for the ball, uh, mostly as animals. And it just shows the impact of power and authority on people uh, and how they can maybe try to uh, fight against it. Um, now, the second question here was, oh yeah, that was the, the, the part that's been censored. Okay, so I have answered that one. Uh, let's see, the next one is the meta commentary on Polish films that they are about nothing was very funny. Most famously, Sunfield was the show about nothing. Are you aware of, Sun of Sunfield ever mentioning being influenced by Polish comedies? Well, no, I am not aware. I don't think um, uh, that Sunfield was able to see that film. I mean, maybe now it's easy, it's on Netflix. But as we mentioned, in the 70s, there were only two copies. In the 80s, there was more. So it's theoretically possible. I am not aware. But uh, that scene is one of the most famous scenes, um, together with a few others, uh, of that film. It, because during that scene, Engineer Mammon is talking about a, a very, very boring scene. And he's actually like replaying it. And it's very clever in, in that way. And those two actors in that scene, they were they, they were not professional actors, but after that film, they became very, very famous and they actually start in other, uh, other films uh, together. They had very specific faces, uh, as you could see. The one who was listening, he was actually, there, there's another urban legend, there's a lot of legends around this film. So he was apparently um, very, very drunk and uh, the face, it's not really reactions to what he's hearing, it's, it's him having hangover. There was also a rule for other directors. Andrzej um, Kondratiuk, who made two more films with both of them, had the rule that this uh, person, this one who's listening, he's not getting any article, alcohol at all. The other one gets like two shots, and that's when they are at their best. So um, let me see. The next question. Thank you so much for sharing this surreal trip on the Vistula River. That small boat as a symbol of Poland makes me also reflect as a Cuban on our island of Cuba as a boat too. 
Cuban cinema has also tried to be critical of totalitarianism. But totalitarianism continues. What would be your advice for Cuban filmmakers and artists? Well, thank you for the question. Now, um, I wouldn't dare to give any uh, advices. As I mentioned before, the regime has different stages. Mm, it's much harder to make fun of it uh, when it's the, the stage of terror. It only becomes possible when the system itself becomes weaker. And the reason the system becomes weaker um, are really usually uh, economical. When people have nothing to eat, that's when they all go to the streets and start fighting for their for food and for freedom, for everything. But it's usually the, the starting point um, is the economy. So um, obviously that would happen at least in the in the Eastern uh, European countries in the in the end of the 1980s. Obviously, the, we will look at the other films during that coming week, um, and uh, we can also we can for sure see it wasn't wasn't just the comedies actually in Poland, but also regular films. They were all using a Sopian language to communicate above the heads of the censors. So that's one way to do it. To and the comedies were always it was always easier for the comedies to make fun of the system because they were not treated as seriously. So they were able, the, the directors were, were able to show much more and make fun uh, of much more. So maybe the answer would be to try to make some comedies. And also, if the system is the same, which means you have to submit the script first, then you have to show things that are not in the script uh, that will symbolize things. And the audience learns how to read those symbols. Like here, as we said, the boat being a symbol of Poland. At the end, uh, uh, the ending, that's actually the, the missing scene in a way. The ending was supposed to be that the um, water goes down and the boat gets stuck. And people were joking that Poland uh, as a boat doesn't meet its Titanic. Uh, the end of a Pol boat called Poland is the fact that it just can't move anymore and people have to just walk back to the um, to the side of the river because there is no water. So that's a very hard question. I don't think I am uh, qualified um, to, to answer that, but obviously you can look at other films from other countries. This one is uh, in a way similar to the Czechoslovakian uh, cinema uh, of the similar time. Mm, you know, so comedies is probably the answer. Was the scene about the sad song an example example of Novomova. In a way, Novomova or Newspeak uh, obviously is mostly about using new words, but also about putting some existing words uh, together. This scene was more about the fact that um, communism was against religion, right? And this lady was singing about heaven. So obviously, uh, first she actually wanted to sing a, a song about Tsar, Loveling the Tsar, and the leader stops her right away because that's not the right song to sing in a communist uh, country, right? And heaven is also a taboo subject because we're not supposed to believe uh, in heaven. So she changes into the grave, which is perfect, but doesn't make sense. So this song is uh, funny in that way, uh, more uh, with the meaning. Um, oh, unless by the said song, you mean the song uh, sang by this uh, young man. Uh, then, yes, that was an example not only of the new speak, Novomova, but also about how you twist ideas around. The problem with the communists, and as I mentioned before, it was, you know, propaganda was everywhere, uh, and propaganda equals lies. So the problem was that there was no truth. There were lies all around us. So in this scene, they're trying to show how they twist the truth in front of our eyes. I mean, we know this song is said, this gentleman who's singing it he has tears in his eyes, he's ready to cry. But the leader uh, of the committee, he is very skilled and he is able to turn everything around. We actually had a, a PR person in the communist government that was very famous uh, for doing that. He would get one question and answer completely another question. So he would just start talking 
for a long time, just like me right now, uh, and just never answer the question. I hope I answer the question. So let me see the next one. Very interesting topic. A big thanks to the presenter. Thank you. Uh, no question, but I would like to share a joke which I heard from my German friend's grandfather, okay, who had been living uh, under DDR, maybe relevant to your conference topic. Let's see. Question. Why the toilet paper in DDR is so rough? Answer. So that every last asshole in the DDR is red. Hmm, a good one. Thank you. Obviously, I didn't read it in advance, so <laughs> excuse my French again. I hope there are no children here. Uh, below 21 in this country, right? Uh, but yeah, of course, um, I am actually doing my research right now about humor in uh, Soviet countries, specifically Poland, but uh, a lot of books talk about Soviet countries in general. And there are some examples uh, of very good jokes uh, in, in those books. And yes, we, we can have a, an insight into what was uh, happening really uh, during that time in the in the society, so let me have a look at the comments because I've also seen there were some new comments appearing. Hilarious thing. Do you see any analogy in today's society with this uh, film? Well, yes. The thing is that not everything that we see in this film uh, disappeared with the change of the system. And that will be the case with uh, other films that we will watch as well, and we will probably go back to that uh, in the future, and we will mention it. Uh, there are some uh, things that uh, in mentality, especially uh, of people that um, you know doesn't depend uh, on the external circumstances um, that much. So. Um, the, the the film also shown in a way that you suppose well it shows how people choose to follow the power uh, for their own comfort uh, in the scene when they decide the committee of the cruise ship decides to expel uh, engineer mammon uh, is a very good example here he brought them some beers they take it they drink with him but at the same time they telling him that uh, he, he is expelled and remember, if you remember the, the dialogue uh, before, the, they were actually, the, there is no proof that he's the one who wrote in the ladies' toilet that the leader is stupid. Uh, they just had the crime and they had to find somebody and decide that he is guilty. That obviously is um, like um, an image of the um, communist legal system. So uh, yeah, th this shows that some uh, some like parts of human nature, uh, I'm afraid, uh, don't change. So that can happen now too, right? I mean, in a corporation, you can work in a corporation, you can go for a beer with your colleagues every day, and then one day find out that behind your back, uh, they got rid of you. Okay, let's see uh, next question. What did the captain symbolize? He seemed to hand over authority to the committee, then fades into the background. He didn't hand the, the authority to the committee because he was not aware of what's uh, happening. I mean, yes, he obviously uh, took uh, the gentleman that we can call a leader. That's what, uh, how it was translated, played by a very famous Polish actor and comedian, Stanisław Tym. So he is an interesting character. He comes to the um, cruise boat. He doesn't have the ticket. He goes in uh, just pretending that he's supposed to work there. And that works in a way because he, he's uh, allowed, but it doesn't work for him very well in the sense that he is forced then to entertain people. That was his role. Um, the, the authority was not given to him. He took it in a way. Uh, the captain is just uh, far away as a, as a figure of, um, you know, the, the head of the country, we could say, the head of Poland. But you could never make fun of the highest person in the country. That was not possible uh, in the 70s, for sure. You could only make fun in comedies or in, in jokes. It was different because jokes were telling, it was, they were called like whispering jokes. They were told to people, you know, in private uh, situations, but uh, in, in a comedy, you could only make fun of a lower rank uh, authorities. 
And um, as I mentioned in, the, in a way before a little bit, the comedies um, at the beginning of the communist systems were making fun of the enemies of the system most of the time. And here we can see when for the first time we are making fun of authority and of the, of the um, mechanisms uh, uh, of power. So that, that is new. And uh, later in the future, there will be more and more films. So if you, if you uh, stay with me this week, every night and next Saturday afternoon, then you will be able to, to see other subjects that were being um, ridiculed and also how it changed uh, because we start with the oldest films, black and white from the 70, 70s, but really 1970 exactly. And we will finish with one from the end of 80s. The rest of them will be uh, colored and very different because as I mentioned before, this one is one and only. Uh, it's very, very different um, than everything else that was ever made. Mr. Marek Pivovsky was asked many times uh, when the system changed in the 90s to make a second part. There were some ideas uh, that never happened. Uh, there, there are talks about it. Even on his website, there is still this idea how it would look like. So he himself, uh, in a way, ag agrees, I guess, that it would be possible to make a similar film now. It would make fun uh, of different things mm, in a way. I mean, this one is a mirror of the society. The comedy is a mirror of the society. So he is making fun of uh, not only other Polish people, but at himself as well, right? He's included in it. Um, so he wanted to do the same thing um, again, but so far, and that hasn't happened. Uh, obviously, now the filmmaking is completely different he will need to find money. Before the government was um, censoring everything, but uh, the money was not a problem, right? As, as soon as they uh, agreed uh, to, to make the film, you know, this one was going for quite a long time uh, because um, they, they actually rented the boat and went on a cruise uh, and it was like um, an oasis um, of peacefulness. And um, it was completely different. There are legends about what was happening on that boat. It was completely different from what was happening uh, on, on the outside. Uh, they were free. For the time of uh, shooting the film, they were free. When the film was finished, obviously, they were not maybe, it was not um, as appreciated by the government as they would like, as I mentioned before. But, um, oh, sorry, that was a message. I don't know if you could hear it. Because some people are putting uh, comments in the other box. Let me have a look. Um, what was the significance of the three guys going into deeper and deeper water as they were talking? Okay, that's just another uh, scene that is making fun. In this case, it's obviously the, uh, the philosopher who is um, talking about the fact that we have to put nature and culture together. So um, I think it was supposed to uh, make fun of this um, uh, academics who use the language that normal people don't understand. And they themselves were going, uh, as you said, deeper and deeper into, into the subject and he was losing them. Uh, so it was just making fun uh, of that. Uh, there is no political uh, meaning uh, in this one. Not every scene uh, obviously had political meaning. The one we mentioned about Polish cinema, for example, was making fun of Polish cinema. Um, and the very in famous one was also the one, um, uh, the, the scene of the contest, when uh, there is a jury um, that is um, asking questions. And here also we can see that um, they expect specific answers. And if you don't give them the answer that they want to hear, your answer is not valid, even if it makes sense, right? So again, it shows uh, the possibility of the authority to turn and twist the, the, the reality, uh, really, the way they, they want it uh, to, to see it. Uh, OK, let me have a look. Mm. Sorry about the fact that I had to 
to read it at the same time. Uh, okay, let's see. But since culture and cinema was controlled by the party, the criticism was not only of Polish cinema, but of the regime itself. Yes, the criticism of the cinema was in that specific scene, but the whole film uh, was obviously, yes, mm, mm, criticizing the, mm, the government and making fun of it, as Mr. Um, Marek Pivowski, the director of the film, mentioned in the letter we read uh, before the screening. Uh, he, he was saying that the government wanted to be scary, uh, wanted people not to laugh. Um, and it's actually uh, obviously nothing new. Um, no authority in the past, uh, if we look centuries ago, ever wanted to be ridiculed, right? Um, and yeah, you could always lose your head uh, for, for doing that. But um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, something called humor studies. There, it's an it's a academic field. And, and people who are studying uh, humor, they actually uh, talk about the fact that it has different uh, um, roles and also humor can be positive uh, and negative. Uh, it can have different, different outcomes uh, and different roles. So um, I am doing my research to see how much you can use um, humor to fight with a regime. And there were different regimes uh, that there, there were studies. Um, in Nazi Germany, um, Soviet Russia, the, and there were differences between them. The, the understanding right now is that in Germany, humor was not a tool of resistance. Um, in, in communist countries, there are different um, opinions about that, but there were differences between uh, those um, governments and authorities. So, um, okay, I'm sorry, but I got another question in the meantime, so let me just have a look at that. Do you see contemporary Polish humor making fun of the reality in Poland today? I don't see many people making fun of modern day capitalism. Uh, well, obviously, we have, um, we actually have cult, Polish cult comedies uh, made after uh, 1989, after the change of the system, so in the 90s. A, a cult film doesn't become cult overnight. It needs, well, at least 10 years or more uh, to become cult uh, because it's uh, a process. So we do have uh, uh, still things that make fun of the reality, it's not always uh, necessarily political. Uh, it could be different things, just like in the case of this film as well. In a way, you know, we are making fun of, of ourselves, uh, of people. And um, Polish people, and they're not the only ones for sure, uh, but they don't like uh, to laugh at themselves. They like to laugh at others, right? They don't really have a great sense of humor about themselves unless it's one of us again, that makes fun, not from outside. I think it's easier to swallow then. So we do, uh, we do have uh, such films. Um, I don't think there was anything similar to that, that we could, you know, I could give you a title to say, yeah, this would be something that was made in the 90s or later uh, and is equivalent. Mm, I think we rather concentrate on um, smaller things in, in comedies now. We are, the, the humor that is now in Poland is more similar to everywhere around the world. Uh, it was very specific for the communist um, uh, rule everywhere uh, in Europe that every joke will, will be almost political. So it can start as a sex joke or a minorities joke or um, blonde right, a joke, but it will always finish, the pun will always be about politics. So that's what many academics uh, wrote about and, and realized that in regular countries, when you can make fun of the system openly, uh, it's usually not the case. Uh, there are different kind of jokes, there are different fashions even uh, for different uh, styles of joke that come and go. Um, but it's not, not the same thing. So I think people, in a way, also 
because during the communist time you had to be on one side or the other everything was politicalized right and i think now a lot of people just uh, want to get away from it a little bit and just live their lives it's obviously not completely possible but um, yeah politics is not the main uh, thing i hope that answers that question let me remind you before i go to the next one that uh, you can also email me um, and ask me questions um, and I will obviously maybe not reply during the retrospective, but next week's when it's over for, for sure, if you want to find out how, how is the director, he is gonna be 85 this year. So that's why uh, his health didn't let him to be here with us today. His state is not very good right now. So we will just keep our fingers crossed and I will be in touch to see how he, how he feels. Uh, let me see. I read this one any chance the censors were actually complicit in the criticism of the system i grew up under that system and i cannot imagine that they would have not cut more from the film okay so first of all they were not rather complicit because it was not really possible they would risk themselves right and also it was always like a group of people just like in the committee on the sh on the ship of the cruise ships there was always more people taking decisions However, um, the, the problem of the uh, um, cuttings uh, and the censorship was changing. So there were moments when you could say more and then there were moments where you could say less. It was all very um, unpredictable. So uh, as, uh, as Mr. Pivovsky mentioned in his letter, the, the scene of Salonowiec, that game that was used here uh, in this film to correct the um, protest really or, or to break the philosopher uh, was seen uh, as, a, as a parody that goes too far right uh, I mean they didn't they didn't like that but in the end the the minister of culture uh, you know decided last minute that yes you can keep it but as I mentioned before there were only two copies made now, the, when the films had so little number of copies, there was no advertisement. So it was like a vicious circle, as, uh, as, uh, as I read in one of the books. The advertisement or the poster could not be printed because there was not enough copies and there was no, no possibility to make more copies because there was no advertisement. So there were other ways for them to try to suppress um, the audience of those films. Uh, Marek Pivovsky with this film was lucky in a sense that it was kept and didn't completely disappear and 10 years later was rediscovered and now it's being rediscovered by different generations over and over again. Obviously now, uh, well first we could have uh, vid video uh, tapes then uh, DVDs and now it's online. That will you, me remind you one more time. It's actually right now on Netflix. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, if it's like every country the same, but it's surely available in the USA. So you can go back, uh, watch it again, or you can tell your friends and uh, tell them that they can watch it too. Okay, let me have a look. Um, hmm. Okay, so with regards to the Kirk Douglas short, how popular were Westerns or Austerns in Poland at the time? Do you have more information about the one African student in the audience? No, I do not. Obviously, we, are, we all see him sitting there, but Polish film school always had uh, international students. Uh, so, um, I, you know, not all of them made huge careers, uh, including Polish uh, students who finished the school, not always they would become famous directors. So I don't think he's famous, but I might be wrong. I don't know who he is. It will be quite hard to find out right now, probably. The film was made uh, 66, well, 54 years ago. Uh, but uh, Kirk Douglas, that's a very interesting uh, thing that happened there. He was, actually there um, to, to visit uh, eastern countries as a um, like a goodwill uh, sign between the west and the east because that was not normal we would not have american actors coming 
But the, at the same time, the film school in Łódź, in Poland, was um, another oasis of freedom, it was a place where you could see um, uh, films from other countries, not just uh, Russian films that were mostly uh, on the screens of uh, Polish cinemas. And uh, obviously that uh, situation was changing as well. Right after the war, the situation was kind of normal. It shortly changed and the quota of films was getting slow, more, um, smaller and smaller for um, Western films and and by Western I mean from Western countries, not Western as such, uh, and bigger and bigger for Russian and other Soviet bloc um, films. So Westerns um, were popular mostly um, on TV later when they were shown. All the films from the uh, either US or Western Europe would come to Poland much later. It was only in the 90s when we started to get uh, films released almost the same time uh, as, as uh, Amer America, Hollywood. But before that, sometimes it would be 10 years, sometimes, you know, it was really, I mean, it was really hard to see a, a film from a Western country. So uh, the people studying in the film school were lucky in this sense. They could see, you know, they watched um, Citizen Kane, uh, they watched French films, um, not just, they obviously watched the Russian films as well, because the, um, the government and the um, teachers in school wanted them to make surrealist films in a specific style. And uh, they were actually learning how to make uh, different kind of films by watching those Western films. And then they learned how to use that um, Aesopian language and how to communicate with the audience without you know, uh, fighting too much uh, with the censors. Uh, let me just have a look here. Okay. Um, so I cannot really answer the question how popular there were. I mean, um, young boys would read books about Indians and, and cowboys, so Western as such was popular. And as you could see in the film, the students prepared themselves very well. They surprised Kirk Douglas uh, by uh, preparing a Wild Wild West saloon and, uh, yeah, and then have some fun with him. He did not expect that. Uh, he looks like he enjoyed it. He also enjoyed uh, kissing all the Polish ladies. Uh, who were giving them like, him flowers. Uh, so yeah, he, he was very happy with that visit, but, um, and he was a famous uh, actor because we still knew, you know, uh, about what's going on in different ways. They were still, uh, we were still getting information about what's happening behind the uh, um, Iron Curtain. But uh, it was sometimes, uh, you know, distributed in illegal ways, especially later. I mean, as you might know, Poland, like other post-communist countries, uh, had this second circulation, as we call it, of books, newspapers, and then later films. Um, so, yeah, so it was, um, it was quite schizophrenic situation. You would... Uh, say and pretend to be one person outside and then at home you would be able to, to talk about the things that you knew were true but you were not allowed to uh, to mention uh, outside right so um uh, now about austerns they were not um, that uh, well the ones that were made in the um, ddr in the eastern um, germany then obviously yes we would get them because uh, all the Soviet bloc uh, films were distributed around the, uh, the whole area, uh, but yeah, not the, not the Western ones. Okay, um, these are all the questions that I have right now. So if you have uh, any other questions, this is your last chance. Well, not really, because as I mentioned before, you can also email me. Let me just quickly, Send my email to the chat one more time. You can ask anything. Um, okay, just a second. Let me make sure I send it to everybody. Yep. Mm. So yeah, you can copy it right now, keep it for later. Um, uh, ask me about the anything that you've seen in the film and was not clear. 
as we say in Poland, there are no stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. So it's on me. But I am really interested if there was anything that you um, were not sure about, that you were completely lost uh, and you were just like, what just happened, you know? So yeah, if there was such thing uh, in the film, because in Poland and in other communist countries, there is this, um, uh, people are sure that nobody who uh, never lived in communist country would understand what it's like and would understand those films. There is this um, belief that Polish cult comedies are understood only by Polish people. Which is quite funny because, you know, before they would say only by Polish people who lived in communist times, but now we have new generations of Polish people who were born after the system change and it's the reality of their parents and they love it. They, they use those quotes um, and yeah, you know, they, they, they see it differently for sure because when we watch it, we know it's true. We remember what it was like, but for them, it's completely um, surreal and they always ask if, you know, if this is real. Sometimes those comedies obviously accumulate a lot of uh, absurd, absurd things. So yeah, maybe it was not exactly that way, especially Stanisław Bareja, which uh, his films we're going to show starting tomorrow, four, four of them. He was the master of Polish cult comedies and uh, of making far, fun of capitalism. So especially in his films, um, that, that was the case. He would just put a lot of crazy things together, but all of them, each of them was true and could happen to you in, in communist reality. There is one more question in the meantime. Is there any similar conference next year? Um, I am not able to answer that question really. I mean, there will be surely conferences and film festivals happening. So you just have to keep on checking the website. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what's going to be you know, organized next year yet. Next year will tell us. Uh, this conference was supposed to happen physically in, in Washington. And uh, you know, on one hand, yes, it is a little bit uh, different and uh, you know, weird, I must say. But uh, on the other hand, we are able to attract people from outside uh, the MV area, which is a plus. OK, there is one more thing here. Let me see. The belief about only Polish people understanding comedies, did that belief extend to Polish diaspora living outside Poland during the Cold War? Um, yeah, I mean, if they were especially, if they knew the reality uh, of communist Poland, either personally uh, or to the family, you know, they, they might. But as I said, I do not agree with that belief. And also I talked to a, um, um, a doctor from Hungary, uh, a doctor of history, and he told me the same thing about Hungarian comedies. Hungarian people believe that only Hungarian people can understand them. And I used to show those uh, comedies to my um, students in Great Britain. And obviously some things do get lost in translation, but uh, you know, they were laughing uh, and, uh, and we had great discussions about them after. So I personally do not uh, agree with that statement. Uh, this one more thing on the other side in the chat. Um, two African filmmakers educated at the Woods Film School are mentioned in this directory, I'm guessing. So I guess you all can see that, right? Oh no, that's only self sent to all panelists. Let me copy that and send it to everyone. So if you are interested in that, you can have a look. Uh, I know we had people from different countries, uh, obviously other communist countries in the film school, uh, but not only. So the Wuch film uh, school was very famous. A lot of people uh, get out of it that you might, can, might have heard of. A lot of cinematographers actually that work in Hollywood also come from, from that uh, place. It was a, a great place, Wuch film school. I hope you can see it now, it's in that link. So yeah, if you want to check who that uh, uh, African filmmaker was, uh, I am not going to do it right now because I have to check if there are more questions. Mm. Okay. I guess this is it uh, for now. So again, if you do think about something else later, you can always email me. 
I will be happy to, to answer. Uh, just give me some time. Maybe it will be more next week than the next, next the week after when this is all finished. But I hope you can join me um, other days. The films will be changing. You can see how they change. Um, the four films by um, Varea that we're going to watch next uh, are very typical um, parodies of the of the reality. So they'll be completely different. All of those films that we are going to show later will be different from what we just seen today. Then the last two by Juliusz Macholski. He is the king of comedy that uh, started in communist times, but uh, you know kept on going, and he made a lot of other cult comedies in Poland, uh, including um, those two, but also before and after. I, we just chose those two because they make fun of the system, and this is the subject of, of, of our uh, study. So to show films here, uh, we need to, um, you know, they, they have to be a cult comedy, and they also have to be about the, the, the political system. So I hope to see you again. Uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, let me just check because it looks like there might be one more. Oh, it just said thank you very much. Thank you as well. I hope to see you again. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.